Okay, y'all, I am having issues with my video and audio syncing up together. So I had a video of myself delivering this lecture, but I am replacing it with video of other things and audio of me delivering the lecture because the audio was behind my face movements and it was driving me crazy. And I assumed it would drive you crazy as well. But I want to dive in to imagism. And we have an Imagism study guide and an Images poetry packet on our Canvas page that you should have been able to look over already. But if you haven't, now is a great time to pull those things up. So the most important thing for you to look at in the Imagism study guide, I think to start with, is probably the definition of imagery. So imagery is the name given to the elements in a poem that spark off the senses. Now, you probably think of picture when you hear the word image, but they don't only need to be visual. They can be any of the five sentences sentence senses so we can have sound images we can have touch images taste smell and of course i don't mean like a literal picture in the poem when i'm talking about this right i mean a description of something that creates a visual for the reader of the poem Now, simile and metaphor are things you're going to need to be very familiar with, too, as we continue this semester, because I will talk about them a lot, and they tend to be extremely common in poetry. You're probably already familiar with these terms, I'm assuming, but let's give just a little refresher. So a simile is a figure of speech that compares two different things, hopefully in an interesting way. And the biggest difference between a simile and a metaphor is just that a simile uses the words like or as to draw the comparison. Comparison. And a metaphor simply states the comparison without using like or as. So the examples I have here, a metaphor would be her lips were a red rose and a simile version of that are her lips were red as a rose. Really a simile is just a type of metaphor if you want to get technical about it, but having these two different terms can help us just be more specific when we're talking about poetry. Now there are other terms in this packet too and they're also important, but but imagery and simile and metaphor are really the big ones to focus on for now, but probably the like third most important word in the study guide for you to know is enjambment. That's something I will talk about a lot this semester when I talk about different poems. Enjambment is a term that we use to talk about line breaks in poetry. So whenever we see a line in a poem that is broken, not at the end of a sentence or not where a comma or even say like a semicolon would go, that is when we say that the line is enjammed. And I will show you instances of this in the poems in the packet so you can see exactly what I mean. Now, why is image so important in poetry and why was imagism such a big movement? So imagism, as has been stated in this little paragraph introduction to imagism at the beginning of your poetry study guide and at the beginning of your images poetry packet, uh, we know that it's a response to romanticism and a response to Victorian poetry. So the Imagist poets were people who were really, really interested in clarity and also in simplicity. You can think of Imagist poetry sometimes as just being there to give you an image of something. Uh, and I know that sometimes Imagist poetry can be frustrating if you aren't somebody who has read a lot of poetry or you're not very familiar with poetry or you prefer things that are maybe more detailed. So I am telling you, please don't panic. Not all of the poems we look at this semester will be like this, uh, but these are important things to learn and it's really important to understand the school of imagism so we can see how poetry has evolved from there. Ezra Pound is considered the founder of imagism, but the person you might hear be associated with it more often than Ezra Pound is actually William Carlos Williams. So the poem of his, The Red Wheelbarrow, that appears in our poetry packet. I believe it is the second poem in the packet. The first one is a poem by H.D. Uh, the Red Wheelbarrow is an extremely, extremely famous poem for its simplicity. The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. 
<laughs> now I've taught this poem every time I have taught this class and I always get a different reaction from students so I am very interested to hear what you think about it since I can't see you in person to see your faces when we read it but it's extremely simple and people often respond to this by saying so what <laughs> why is this poem about a red wheelbarrow so important now, William Carlos Williams, the man who wrote The Red Wheelbarrow, he really, really believed in imagism, in the importance of the object and the concrete image as what he thought to be the best way to communicate in poetry. He believed in individual images carrying a lot of weight in symbolism. So I want you to pay attention to what is present in this poem because it's so small and so short. The things that are included are really, really important. So this first line, so much depends here we have a break in this poem. It's a perfect example of enjambment, right? So much depends. Break upon break. A red wheel break. Barrow break. This poem is all enjambment. But so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow. If we just stop there and think about the red wheelbarrow, when the poet says so much depends upon this, and we have this vision of a red wheelbarrow, and it's raining outside next to the chickens, what I immediately think of is a farm, right? The red wheelbarrow stands in for the farm, and it also becomes symbolic of the work done on the farm. When I begin thinking about the work done on the farm, I begin thinking about the farmers, the people who are employed by the farmers. I think about the chickens, who's collecting the eggs. There's a whole story in this poem just with the things that are in here standing in for ideas and larger symbols than themselves. Now this can be difficult to do if you're not used to it, and especially if you're someone who hasn't read a lot of poetry, but if you can try to turn off the analysis part of your brain for a minute, consider appreciating the poem just for the images it provides. Just because you took a second to look at a piece of art and it conjured up a really, really specific visual a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Now, you might not agree, but I think that's an interesting and arresting image, and it stops and makes me think, and it makes me appreciate the beauty that can be there in everyday objects, and that is what imagism is all about. Now, William Carlos Williams and Ezra Pound were some of the more extreme of the people in the school of imagism. William Carlos Williams in particular was known for saying no ideas but in things and really wanted to leave as much out of the poem as possible besides the image. And I'm going to go really in detail about sort of the politics of that ideology in a later lecture, but for now let's just kind of skate around it. If you have more expansive taste and prefer poems with a little more description in them, you might like the Amy Lowell and T.S. Eliot poems in the images packet a little more. These are a little fuller, especially the long T.S. Eliot poem Preludes that has lots and lots of description. Not anywhere near as spare as William Carlos Williams' poetry in the images school. Now, Amy Lowell in particular got some pushback for calling herself an imagist and writing the way she did. Ezra Pound, I believed, said that she didn't do imagism, she did Amyism. Now, I would disagree with him. I think that the mixture of observation and personal details and imagism in an Amy Lowell poem is exactly what makes it a really strong interesting and beautiful poem, a great example of an imagist poem. Now forgive me for not being specific, I was talking about a London thoroughfare, 2 a.m. I just realized I put two Amy Lowell poems in this packet. The other one is Autumn, which is also beautiful, but much simpler than a London thoroughfare. Now what is different about a London thoroughfare than a William Carlos Williams images poem is that Amy Lowell uses the word I. This is the biggest difference in craft between Amy Lowell and poets like William Carlos Williams and Ezra Pound. The decision to include the self in the poem. This is something that Pound and Williams were very very against. They wanted things to be what they called objective. 
but I think Lull inserting herself into the poem is exactly what makes this poem very effective, and I think it's one of the reasons that people respond more to this poem when I teach it than they tend to to the red wheelbarrow. Of course, it's going to depend a lot on your own personal taste, but sometimes people find it easier to connect with something when there is a human element there. Now I want to draw your attention again to the T.S. Eliot poem in the packet, Preludes, and I'm just going to read the first section of the poem for you. Preludes. One. The winter evening settles down with smell of steaks in passageways. Six o'clock, the burnt out ends of smoky days, and now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots, the showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots, and at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps, and then the lighting of the lamps. Now this one uses rhyme, and that might make it a little more appealing or maybe feel a little more familiar if you're feeling a little alienated by these spare images poems. But I want to draw your attention to the different types of imagery used in Preludes by P.S. Eliot. Now when you're reading William Carlos Williams or Ezra Pound, you're much more likely to get very concentrated visual images. And I'm a fan of the way that T.S. Eliot uses sound imagery quite a bit in this poem. We have a lonely cab horse steams and stamps. You can hear the horse's feet stamping there. But also the smell of steaks in passageways. We have the smell image. That's kind of rare. Uh, I really recommend, as you go through these poems, reading them out loud to yourself. There's a reason I read some of them out loud for you during the lecture, although I won't go through and read all of them out loud. I know that would get a little boring for you. But that's because poetry is made to be heard, right? When poets sit down to construct something, they're always thinking about sound, and especially a poet like T.S. Eliot here. So you really get something extra from the poem when you read it out loud, so you can hear the craft coming alive. I'm going to leave this lecture here for now so I don't overwhelm you too much by going super deep into imagism, but please stay tuned and read the directions on our Canvas page to make sure you know what to do next, and you'll be hearing from me very soon.